Title, Mandate to Rule. Principle, Scripture teaches the sons of God who make the rapture have all things prepared for them. <clears throat> Turn to Luke, 21st chapter. Luke, 21st chapter. Verse 35, 36. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So it's going to be an evaluation. And after that evaluation, all things will be given to those past evaluation. Turn to Revelation, third chapter, verses 10 to 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is speaking to those who have passed evaluation. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So this is not mentioned anywhere else until after it's spoken of. They have passed evaluation. They have been found that they have kept the word. Therefore, they now, all they have to do is wait, continuing to do what they're doing until he comes. Now, what we find, <clears throat> we want to break down the next passage of Scripture. Revelation 3, verse 12. And here we have the mandate to rule. Him that overcometh but I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, what does this mean? What is the significance of this? Well, to be a pillar means to be a support. What he's saying here is that he will be a central support in the temple. Principle. The temple is a place reserved for only the highest servants who perform the service to Elohim the creme de la creme only they are allowed in the temple at the time of the ministry that they have to carry out they're exclusively the only group they will do it. see an example of that Revelation 15 verses 5 to 8 After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having in their breasts girded with fine girdles. Now this is basically the antitype to the ancient Arianic priesthood. The priest was dressed in white. They had... Um, uh, headgear, miters on their heads, and they had robes and sashes, and they would perform the service in the temple. This is the antitype of that. These are the elect and select, and these are not celestial angels. These are beings from the body of Christ who are given the ministry office of officiating in the temple during the tribulation period. Notice what it goes on to say. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. So we find that this is a preeminent position 
But this comes directly from the Father. Vials filled with the wrath of God. And it doesn't describe what the wrath of God is, what kind of a substance it is, but it's a vial. <clears throat> and it's only given exclusively to the inner circle to perform the uh, basic act action that sets in motion the wrath of God. Verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man, the word man is in italics, what it's saying is no intelligence whatsoever was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So, what's being said here in Revelation 12, is these are individuals that come from the human race. They come out of the body of Christ. And they're exalted to the highest position of office that is in the temple. Exclusively in the temple. Even the elders can't do what these individuals are doing. <clears throat> they perform a service, and while they're performing the service, the temple is sealed to everybody except them until the service, the wrath of God, <coughs> the judgment is taken and uh, completed. Revelation Let's go back to Revelation 3, verse 12. <clears throat> Make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God. This is the name of the Father. The word right there is etch. What does it signify? Well, it signifies basically the possessor of the Father's name has infinite authority over the creation. Infinite authority over the creation when it carries the Father's name because what he does is done by the authority of the Father. Turn to Hebrews, the second chapter verses 7 to 8. <clears throat> that made this Tim a little lower than the angels. That's where we are now. Thou crownest Tim with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. The word things is in italics. So basically it's saying, Thou has put all in subjection under his feet. For in that, he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That's total authority over the entirety of of the creation, primary and secondary. Turn to Matthew 24, verses 45 to 47. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? It's talking about the one that the Lord has authorized to teach his word <coughs> when it is required. In other words, to be selective, to give those meat in due season <coughs> when it is needed by those who need it. goes on 
within is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made rule over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily, truly, I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all. A-L-L. -L, all is good. That's the entirety of everything. <clears throat> the totality. Totality. Entirety. Totality of all. Turn back to Revelation, the third chapter. Verse 12. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. <coughs> well, I read differently than yours. How's that? Revelation 3.12. Yeah. Him that overcometh will I say, he shall go no more out. That's 3.12. Revelation 3.12. Yeah. That's the first part. He that overcometh will I make it pull in the temple, and he shall no more go out. We oh. did that. Now we're going down. We did the name of the Father. And we're going down beyond that. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Now this, the New Jerusalem, it's called New Jerusalem in the New Testament. It's called Zion in the Old Testament. And it's <coughs> spoken of extensively in the Old Testament. The city of God is called Zion in the New Jerusalem. It is the seat of the government of the whole creation, primary and secondary. Turn to Psalms 48, verses 1 to 6. Here we have an interesting description of the city. And not only of the city, but the activity of the city. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion of the sides of the north. Now when it's talking about Beautiful for situation. It's talking about uh, Zion. <clears throat> it's described as the epitome of beauty. There's nothing more splendid, more regal, more glorious than heavenly Zion. <clears throat> In uh, Psalm, the 50th chapter, it's, taught, it's called the perfection of beauty. In other words, the essence, the quintessence. There's nothing that can compare with it anywhere in the creation. And then he goes on. <clears throat> the joy of the whole earth. Uh, earth, here's not he's talking about the planet. He's talking about the whole creation. Knows of heavenly Zion. Heavenly Zion is um, unique. It's called a tabernacle. That means a tabernacle, of course, is a portable tent. It means that the city can travel. It can change position. <clears throat> On the sides of the north, uh, its location is described in the recesses of the hidden. In other words, its location is in the high point of what is hidden. It's <clears throat> described as a mountain on which the city rests, Mount Zion. It's a fortified region. It <clears throat> is in a location <coughs> in which it can survey the entirety of all the creation. It goes on talk about the 
city of the great king. Of course, it's Elohim. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. In other words, the Zion has a history uh, since the fall of Lucifer of engaging actively in things that have taken place in the lower creation. There's four. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw and so they marveled and they were troubled and hastened away. It's talking about the Luciferian kings were engaged in some activity. Zion appeared and they were put to flight. Fear took hold upon them there in pain as of a woman in travail that breaketh the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Okay, so we see an example of this over in Revelation sixth chapter verses twelve to seventeen. I beheld, when you had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black, as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne for, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and we shall be able to stand. So the inference is that these Luciferian kings know exactly what's going to happen when heavenly Zion appears. <coughs> and it spells the end for them. And fear takes a hold of them, just like the scripture in Psalm says, throughout uh, the history of the lower creation, Heavenly Zion has been known for a refuge throughout the creation. doesn't mean that the city moves into the lower creation. It means that the city can project its light, its luminosity into any point of the creation to bring about whatever the Father wants at that particular time. So Zion has a reputation as a city in which <clears throat> justice and order will prevail in whatever circumstance, no matter how dark a corner of the creation exists. Heavenly Zion, if so chooses, can project itself into that area and bring a quarter out of chaos. The Luciferians, the infant says, are scared to death. The scripture tells us when Satan is cast out of heaven, it says he knows he has but a short time. So these characters know what's waiting for them. They understand they've been given a certain amount of rope. They've been given a certain amount of time. That's why they pull out all stops to do everything as quickly as they can because they know it's going to be shut down at a certain period of time. The human race does it. <clears throat> so the in inference is the scripture is giving us the understanding that we have to see our lives, to see the progress of things that are happening from the overall perspective. God has everything on a timetable and at a certain point he's going to shut everything down. So they're given the name of the New Jerusalem, 
which means that they carry the authority of the city in whatever circumstance they are dispatched to or choose to uh, this is going to come to pass in the end of the tribulation period where the Lord is going to <clears throat> assign certain segments, certain sectors of the creation to those that are going to administer justice. Turn back to Romans, the 8th chapter. <clears throat> Verses 20 to 21. <clears throat> For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's why the creation looks to the sons of God. Because the creation knows that they're going to be its deliverers. <coughs> more so than the Christians that are destined to deliver it. Revelation, back to Revelation 3rd chapter. <clears throat> we talked about the name of the Father, the name of the city. Now the last part. <clears throat> and I will write upon him my new name. I puzzled over this for a long time. What does he mean by his new name? Because the scripture says that God has given him a name above all names. In the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And what I got back from the Holy Spirit impressed me tremendously. That has to do with <clears throat> the name of Jesus in this life, in, in this particular circumstance, is the name above all names, but it is not a universal name. Case in point, in Hebrew, he's called Yeshua. In Greek, he's called Jesus. English, he's called Jesus. In Korean, he's called Isu. So you have many different names for him. In eternity, he's not going to be called Jesus. He's not going to be called Yeshua. He's not going to be called Yeshu. He's going to be called by a universal name that everybody will call him by. Just as our names won't be what they are in this life. We have a new name waiting for us in eternity. And it's the name that the Father will call us by is the name <clears throat> we'll be known by which represents the characteristic that we are. In other words, it would be the name that identifies us as who we are in the line of the sons of God. So all things are waiting for us. All things have been prepared what we're waiting for now is the evaluation and the final progression toward completion. Even to those who complete their course. Title, The Shield of Faith. Principle, Scripture teaches saints become defeated by having their faith demolished. That's the main way that the enemy brings Christians down, is he attacks their faith. Turn to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 16. Is it uh, six, what? Sixth chapter, verse 16. 16. Oh, Ephesians 6, 13 and 16.
Ephesians 6, 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In other words, the word fiery darts there is fiery missile. The enemy launches weapons from the spiritual realm and it affects us in the physical realm. And these weapons are all designed to weaken our faith. So what that basically is saying is that it's going to generate situations and circumstances in which our faith, our walk, is going to be tested. I'm going to take a look at an example of that. There you find this example interesting. Let's take a look at the example of Peter. What happened to him? <clears throat> Turn to Matthew, 16th chapter. Matthew 16, verse 21 to 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So we notice what Jesus says. He's not addressing Peter, he's addressing Satan. Because he can see Satan operating in Peter's life. What Satan did was to put a thought in Peter's mind, and Peter responded to that thought. Now to Peter, to human thinking, Peter was saying, no, you know, you're not going to be killed. No, no, that, that's not what's going to happen. But what Peter was accepting was something that was contrary to God's word. He's rejecting the word of God, not realizing what he was doing. And Jesus yeah. rebukes Satan, trying to influence Peter. But what happened was Peter received he received this contrary belief. It was lodged in his thinking. Now, Jesus, knowing that Satan had built a stronghold in Peter, later on lets him know. Turn to Luke twenty second chapter. Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses 31 to 32. Luke 22, verses 31 to 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. So Jesus sees the influence of Satan on Peter. And he goes on. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Now, the word fail there is cease not. And when thou art converted, Strengthen thy brethren. So he knows that Peter's faith is going to undergo a trial because Peter has received this stronghold in his thinking. Get the further understanding of Jesus understanding what Peter is experiencing. Turn to um, Turn to uh, Luke, we're in the 22nd chapter, verses 33 to 34. Verse 
following verses. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both unto prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day <coughs> before thou shalt have before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So the Lord tells Peter what's going to happen. Now, turn to Matthew 26, <coughs> verse 35. <coughs> The 26 verse 35 Peter said unto him though I should die with thee yet will I not deny thee likewise also said all the disciples <clears throat> so Jesus is trying to explain to them particularly Peter that they're operating under satanic influence but the human mind can't gauge objectively their thinking they're, they're just as faithful as they ever will be their faith and Jesus is unflagging and willing to go with him to the death. And Satan's plan is working to perfection. The enemy will plant thoughts in the mind contrary to the will of God. The disciples believed in Jesus, but they did not believe in his word. That's the big difference. That's where they make a critical error. Now, turn to the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, verses 10 to 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. <coughs> the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So this is the beginning of the nullification of Peter's faith. Turn back to Matthew 26 chapter, verse 55 to 56. Matthew 26, verse 55 to 56. And in that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief, with swords and staves, for to take me? I said daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid no hand on me. But this, all this was done, the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. When? when they saw him being taken prisoner. What happened? <clears throat> well, they were totally unprepared. They believed in Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus was all-powerful. That Jesus was um, somebody that would always be with them. They would be with him. But they were not prepared for this. They did not, had not, they never believed what he said and our faith is based off of what God says the word 
of God. Satan took advantage of that to install a thought contrary to what Jesus said in the mind of Peter. It germinated and came to a point where it totally devastated his faith. In other words, his world collapsed around him. His world was built around Jesus. But when to his human thinking, Jesus was taken, he didn't have any way of dealing with it. He was the other disciples. And he fled. Fear took all of them. All of them. Now, what we find here is this principle. But he did want to fight. He cut off the guy's ear. At first, because he thought he was defending Jesus. He was prepared to fight to the death. He was not prepared for Jesus to totally surrender and go into captivity. And that just blew everybody's mind. Scripture teaches, Peter's faith weakened because his world was shattered. As were the other disciples. Their faith was centered on the present world, not on Jesus' word that he would rise again. They totally totally obliterated what Jesus had said. He said, I'm going to die. <clears throat> and Satan went right in and put a stronghold in Peter's mind and the rest of them not to believe that. And Peter spoke. What do you believe? No, Lord, you're not going to die. We're going to allow that. And Jesus rebuked him. But he never, never gave up the belief that Jesus would not die. So his faith was undermined from the beginning. Now we start, we see how this spread throughout <clears throat> the disciples. Turn to Luke, 24th chapter, verses 15 to 21. Twenty-fourth chapter, verses fifteen to twenty-one. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. Fifteen. Okay. They passed, and while they communed together and reasoned. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. This is on the road to Emmaus. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk in a sand? <clears throat> and one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered and said unto him, <clears throat> Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which come to pass here in these days? He said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. In other words, he's dead. That's it. Every one of his disciples knew what he had said, that, they would, that he would rise again. Yet and still, the belief was so strong that it's over, he's dead, that they never, they never considered. That is the influence of Satan. <coughs> the weapon that he uses is a thought starts with a thought starts with a thought contrary to the will of God now your faith will go in either direction if you latch on to that thought contrary to the will of God it builds a stronghold weakens your faith to the point when the time comes Jesus told Peter I have prayed that your faith fail not. In other words, 
when the time of testing of your faith arrives, that your faith will hold. I've prayed that. So what Satan does is he engineers circumstances in which the thought that he's planted, the stronghold that he's planted, will be activated. And it will crack open, wide open the strength of your faith. That's why Paul says, take the shield of faith so you can quench all the up so they can't reach the vulnerable parts of you. In other words, you don't receive anything that's contrary to the will of God. Every, every time a Christian backslides <coughs> or walks away, it's in response to a thought which ultimately genders an action or a belief contrary to the will of God. And the mind soaks that stuff up like a sponge. And it can take years and years and years, even though you might recommit and come back to the Lord to eradicate. It's like a sore, a running sensitive area that the Holy Spirit has to heal. <clears throat> we see this as an example with Peter. It took a long time to get Peter back to the point where he should be. Uh... <clears throat> We see Cleophas, the disciples, <coughs> they didn't believe. Um, turn to the Gospel of John, 20th chapter. And we want verse 25. Thomas, not there when Jesus makes his appearance. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. The thought so contrary to the truth of God's word that it took a long, long time to restore them back to a point in which their faith was totally restored. Particularly with Peter. Now, Peter was the first one, the scripture says, that Jesus, of the disciples, <clears throat> that Jesus had an encounter with at the tomb. But even so, Peter still was not totally restored. Turn to uh, Gospel of John, 21st chapter. Verses 15 to 17. <coughs> they had dined. Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now, the word love here. <coughs> there were two, uh, there are two categories in the Greek which are translated love in this capacity in verse 15 Jesus asked Simon Peter lovest thou me the word there is agapeo divine love do you agapeo me more than me and Peter answers him the, the, the first time <coughs> now he says, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I... He doesn't use the word agape. He uses the word phileo, which is human love. And Jesus answered him the second time. He said again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, agape all thou me. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo thee. Peter could mm -hmm. not bring himself to use the word agape love. And then the third time, saith unto him, Jesus says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, phileo me. Do you love me with a human love? And this wife he around. <clears throat> he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I phileo thee. He saith unto him, Feed.